Is the dog any part of the investigation at this point right now? I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't have the answer for you. I'm not sure. So that was Idaho State Police Communications Director Aaron Snell laughing in the face of Lawrence Jones. Lawrence Jones hosts a show named Cross Country on Fox News. Everyone's talking about that show that aired on Saturday evening at 10 p.m. Well, today as I film this, it is now Sunday, November 27th at 3.09 p.m. And I've linked to the entire show below so you can watch the whole thing. But that was just a segment that, yeah, it was surprising. I understand Lawrence's question. He's asking, did Kaylee Goncalves' dog, is the dog part of the investigation? Now, I don't know if Aaron Snell got a vision of like Scooby-Doo in his head or something, but it made him laugh at the question. But it really is a valid question. Later in the show, Lawrence speaks with another expert and he actually thanked the man for taking Lawrence's questions about the dog seriously. And it is a serious question. I hope the dog Murphy has been examined. We've heard a little bit about the dog being placed with someone else, the dog Oddly enough, being recovered later that night, November 13th. You would think as soon as police got to the crime scene, if the dog were still there, Murphy would have been running around or was he locked up or... That's what Lawrence was trying to get at. But Mr. Snell laughed in his face. He couldn't hold it in. He probably wasn't thinking in terms of Maybe this reporter wants to know if the dog was examined. Did the dog have any injuries? Did the dog look like he had any cuts on him or had he been bound or anything? Now, police have maybe answered that question, maybe not directly, maybe in a roundabout way, but for him to laugh at the question, yikes. But it's not the only thing that happened in that interview that really surprised me. I want to go over just a small portion of it with you where Kaylee's dad said, we're finding out there's more than just my daughter and these children that suffered. Kaylee's dad is going to go on a little bit of a rant against the police, but I'm reading in between the lines and I want to see what you think about what he says. What is Kaylee's dad trying to tell us without directly telling us because the police have told him to keep quiet about certain things. Let's go. At the end, we're going to talk about a rumor going around, but it's not necessarily what Kaylee's family is referring to. So here we go. Again, today, it's been two weeks since this horrible Idaho Four, as they're calling them, lost their lives. And thankfully, Kaylee's dad, Steve, and Kaylee's family, they are the ones speaking out the most. And I'm grateful for that. I don't believe they're going to ruin any investigation by speaking with the press. You can see they're wearing their heart on their sleeves. And by what Steve is saying, it makes you wonder if he's trying to warn the community that they could be in danger, maybe even more so than they believe. At the beginning of the interview, Lawrence speaks about people in town are inundating locksmiths to get locks on their doors, which is kind of surprising. Maybe they just want their doors really insulated, really, you know, you can't kick it down. But Lawrence asked Steve, when was the last time you talked with law enforcement about the case? Steve notes, we just had a vacation. So we just came off of Thanksgiving and Black Friday and everything. Steve said law enforcement told him they were gonna drop off a little bit and not to expect the same type of communication that he had before. They were going to pass it on to another person. So basically, long story short, it was Wednesday, 5 p.m. was the last time they reached out to me. So yeah, that's rough. Well, we just had a vacation. Uh, law enforcement told me that um, they were gonna drop off a little bit and not to expect the same type of um, communication that I had gotten before. They pass it on to another person. So basically, long story short, it was Wednesday, 5 p.m. was the last time that they reached out to me. So, yeah, that's rough. That's what Steve said. So on the one hand, we can see photos and see reports of law enforcement still working hard throughout the Thanksgiving holiday, even on Thanksgiving Day. With Steve, you can tell he's getting frustrated because he's saying they're telling me communication will drop off. Lawrence asked, what are they telling you? Steve said, they're just kind of telling me that they can't tell me much, which is frustrating to me because I've been very trustworthy. I do know things. I haven't shared things. 
So Steve is saying he knows stuff he hasn't shared, so he's proven to police, look, you can tell me stuff and I'm not going to run and go tell the press immediately. You know, I'm not going to post it on Facebook or something like that. But Steve is saying, look, we are the same family that found out the original timeline. We're the same family that broke into the phones. We tried everything in our ability to try and get into this system because a court order is not the fastest thing. So we broke in and we did what we did. We have some family passwords that we all share. So we broke in and we helped them. So it's hard for me to give up as a father my protective ability to other men. And that was like, oh. Sir, what are they telling you? They're kind of just telling me that they can't tell me much, which is frustrating to me because I've been very um, trust, trustworthy. I, I, I don't I do know things. I haven't shared things. Um, we're the same family that found the original timeline. We're the same family that broke into the phones. We tried everything in our ability to try to get into this system because a court order is not the fastest thing. So we we broke in and we did what we did. We know that we have some family passwords that we all share. So we broke in and we helped them. So it, it, it's hard for me to give up as a father my protective ability to other men. You can imagine, I can't imagine the way this dad feels, but he doesn't mean literally broken to phones, but he means his daughter Kaylee was on her mother's phone plan, cell phone plan. They were able to get in there and see all those calls that Kaylee made to her ex-boyfriend, Jack DeCour, ending prior to 3 a.m. on the fateful morning at 2.52 a.m. And so he's saying, look, we helped you guys. We helped police. We're not running to the press and telling them everything. It's almost like, look, don't give up on this. Steve is even going to say, I'm asking police first. What can I tell the public? What can I tell the press? Lawrence said, sir, they've shared with us that it was a targeted attack. Can you give us any information about that? Have they told you who the target was or given you more insight than they have the public? Steve said they, and then he goes into a little rant saying, I don't wanna talk bad about him because these are some hardworking individuals. We know in the last video how Kaylee's family said cops told them there was one target out of the Idaho Four. Police know who that targeted person was allegedly, but they won't share it with the family. And they criticize cops for being vague and, you know, semantics and details, but cops are listening. They did update the timeline that Kaylee's sister Olivia wanted them to. They have updated the timeline with Kaylee and Madison getting home at 1.56 a.m. But Steve goes on to say, and I have, I'm doomed without them. We're all doomed without them. And Lawrence says, yeah, it's sad for him to believe that he's doomed without police. Of course, we love police and the work they do, and they risk their lives to solve crimes like these. But it's sad for me to think Steve thinks he's doomed without police. He's not doomed without police. God can work through anyone to catch this criminal. But Steve starts talking about this defund police is just a terrible idea. The fact that we're finding out that there's more than just my daughter and these children that have suffered, it's terrible to think that we can defund these guys. So this is where I'm wondering what the heck is Steve talking about? You know, some people may get lost in the politics, but I'm wondering, is he talking about this defund police is just a terrible idea. The fact that we're finding out that there's more than just my daughter and these children that have suffered. What does he mean? Does he mean just because there's a dearth of police officers and not enough resources prior to this crime in Moscow? I don't know what he's talking about. Mm. Sir, they have shared with us that it was a targeted attack. Can you give us any information about that? Have they told you who the target was or, or given you more insight than they have the public? They, I don't want to talk bad about them because these are some hardworking individuals and I have, I'm doomed without them. We're all doomed without yeah. them. This defund police is just a terrible idea. The fact that we're finding out that there's more than just my daughter and these children that have suffered, 
It's terrible to think that we can defund these guys. Now, there hasn't been this type of crime we know where someone lost their life in this way in seven years. So why would Steve say the fact that we're finding out that there's more than just my daughter and these children that have suffered? It's terrible to think that we can defund these guys. I don't know if Steve is trying to say that he has learned that this is a serial offender who is linked to this crime because he's saying the fact that we're finding out that there's more than just my daughter and these children that have suffered. By saying that, obviously Steve knew crimes took place before his daughter and these children, as he said, have suffered. Obviously he knew crimes took place prior to the Idaho 4 being done away with so horribly. So why is he bringing that up? And he's mentioning the horrible idea of defund the police. And I get it, it's a horrible name. The name should have never been called defund the police, but we're not gonna get all into that. Why is he bringing that up in relation to this crime? Is he trying to warn us that this crime is related to a different crime? but because of a dearth or a lack of law enforcement, you know, power, personnel, backup, that they couldn't connect it until now? Or why would he bring that up? And maybe he's trying to hint to us and hint to the town and hint to University of Idaho parents. Is that why Kaylee's family is so frustrated? Is he relating it to any other incidents at the University of Idaho? I don't exactly understand what Steve is referencing. Now we know the police have said they don't believe this Idaho incident was related to other stabbings in the past, one where there was one survivor in a different state. It's curious, perhaps it'll come out. Lawrence communicated he's been speaking with law enforcement too. I'm not sure if they asked him also to hold something back as a reporter. But again, Steve keeps going saying it's an absolute atrocity. That's not something that is um, political. It's not political. This is just facts, guys. We can't allow these people to just run free. So beyond that, they haven't shared a lot. an absolute atrocity that's not something that is um it's political it's not political this is just facts guys we can't allow these people to just run free so beyond that they haven't shared a lot so steve doesn't appear to be going on some type of political rant here there's a means to an end there's a method to what he's saying but it's hard to figure out because I believe he, he's supposed to be holding it inside. Are police connecting whoever harmed these precious four University of Idaho student souls? Are they connecting that with a serial offender? Are they not telling the public yet again because they're just waiting on forensic results and everything to just lock it down and go arrest this person. It kind of jibes with some of the rumors that are floating around. And again, these might just be wild rumors because people are trying to fit in different plot points that are missing in this story. So with Steve saying, we can't allow these people to just run free. It's almost as if he's saying they know who it is, but the person can't be brought in yet. I feel like he's speaking more than in generalities. I feel like he's speaking with a purpose for some reason, but he just can't come out and say it. And he goes beyond that, they haven't shared a lot. So he's almost saying that's what the police are sharing. The fact that we're finding out that there's more than just my daughter and these children that have suffered. So he's saying there's more. There are more people that have suffered and he's connecting it somehow with the movement to defund the police, which really isn't about defunding the police, it's about coming against police brutality, but again, it's just horribly named. I don't know. Steve says, we have some private detectives that have reached out to us and given us information. We take that with a grain of salt. We try to be very careful. Just today, I reached out to the officers and said, hey, this guy has treated me with respect on the show. So he's talking about Lawrence. And Steve said to the cop, I'd like to share some things with him that I found out on my own. 
and they ask me not to do that. So we're holding our tongue, we're waiting, we're waiting patiently, but we're definitely concerned. We have some private detectives that have reached out to us and given us information. We take that with a grain of salt and we try to be careful. Just today, I reached out to the officers and said, hey, this guy's treated me with respect on the show. I'd like to share some things with him that uh, that that I found out on my own. And they asked me to not do that. So we're, we're holding our tongue. We're waiting patiently, but we're definitely concerned. So that was very honorable that Steve said, look, Lawrence, this reporter has treated me with respect. Can I tell him what I found out? Cops are saying no. So Steve says he's waiting, he's waiting patiently, but we're definitely concerned. Now, is he concerned for the way the investigation is going, the lack of results thus far that we know about? I'm sure he is. But also, is he concerned because this could affect the community at large? So anyway, Lawrence goes on to say he talked with the same officials. He was able to get some info from them. We want to do everything we can to get you answers and to solicit more information for the timeline. But there's gaps in that timeline. Is there anything that you can share with us that may put people in that direction where they would feel willing to share about that timeline? Indeed, a lot of people specifically talk about wanting to know more about gaps in the timeline for Zena and Ethan. Was Ethan really the target here? What is happening? Why are there gaps? I know it takes time to gather information, but hopefully cops could fill it in a little bit more for people because, for example, if they're able to find out, okay, Maddie and Kaylee did such and such earlier in the day, before the corner club, before the food truck, well, that would help people, again, be able to look at their cameras. They'll know in this area. Police have given a general guideline of where they want info, where from 3 to 6 a.m. they want info. But if they knew Maddie and Kaylee were somewhere at noon, for example, in a certain area, that could be added to the timeline so folks could pull more footage, see if any weirdos are there, or like they're going to say, they can see if cops can figure out if someone's alibi doesn't check out. So Steve is saying, I heard a little bit of feedback on this that people are nervous about the timeline. I'm gonna tell you guys that there's so much attention on this. If you can share your information, if you can post it, I mean, it's the internet, you can do these things anonymously. And I'm grateful that they have links and people have been uploading footage and I'm sure images. So that reminds me of the Kylie Rodney case when they're telling people, like Steve said, go forward, you don't have to. And for those people who are afraid, like maybe I was intoxicated, I'm underage. That's not what they care about, guys. They're not looking at that. That is not going to happen, so give your information. So don't worry if you're a teenager, maybe doing something you shouldn't have been doing. Who cares? If you have a photo, give it to police. Who knows what can be in the background of a photo or what's not there? So Steve said, give out that picture, that image, that video, that selfie, whatever it is, give it out. And know that there's zero chance that they're coming to you for, you know, ruining your career or anything along those lines. They're just looking for data right now and you could be the key. You might be something that has been overlooked. So I just implore people to come forward, especially when you know you're even close to that timeline because technology is the only thing that doesn't lie really. Yeah. So sir, I had the opportunity to speak with those same law enforcement officials today and was able to get some information out from them as well. We want to do everything that we can do to get you answers and to solicit more information for the timeline. But there's gaps in that timeline. Um, is there anything that you can share with us that may put people in that direction where they would feel willing to share about that timeline? Um. I've heard a little bit of feedback on this that people are nervous about the timeline. I'm gonna tell you guys that there's so much attention on this. If you can share your information, if you can post it, I mean, it's the internet. You can do these things anonymously. Go go forward, you don't have, and, and for those people who are afraid, like maybe I was intoxicated or underage, that's not what they care about, guys. They're not looking at that. That is not going to happen. So. Give your information, give give out that that picture, that image, that video, that selfie, whatever it is, give it out and know that 
there's zero chance that they're coming to you for, you know, ruining, ruining your career or, or your anything along those lines. They're just looking for data right now. And you could be the key. You might be something that has been overlooked. So I just implore people to come forward, especially when you know you're even close to that timeline because technology is the only thing that doesn't lie, really. That reminded me of CBI agent Kevin Kobach interviewing Chris Watts' mistress, Nicole Kessinger, when he said, people lie, phone records don't. Phone records might not lie. I don't necessarily agree with Steve. I used to agree that data doesn't lie or video doesn't lie. But these days in the age of deep, deep fakes and so many other things, even video can lie. But it's still helpful. I mean, I watch people on Facebook analyzing, you know, the food truck video and they're looking at way in the background and one guy looks like he's tying a shoe. Another person thinks it's a bench. Another person is like, is that a weirdo staring at them or is it just some bros hanging out? So it can help. But he said, data is better than an eyewitness. It's better than anything we can produce. It's right up there with DNA. So I do believe, yeah, data can be better than an eyewitness because eyewitnesses can swear up and down. They saw a six feet tall redhead when it's reality. It was a five foot tall brunette. So it happens. Steve went on to say, I just implore you. Sometimes if you think that selfie has nothing in the background, maybe there's a car that should be there that somebody said in their alibi i parked right there next to this tree and then there's that tree and there's nothing your car's not there so yeah you know imagine if you were at the corner club that night or if you were at the food truck that night and you took a selfie or a video or something a TikTok, and you're like well i don't see madison and kaylee in it so it doesn't matter well it still might matter and others around the frat house wherever ethan and zana were wherever even if you didn't catch them in the background you're helping cops because you're getting helping them fill in that timeline to say, well, this person said they were at the corner club, you know, at whatever midnight, and I don't see them in any of these photos. So that could help them. It's just data. And then we can analyze it as a society and determine what it is, but it doesn't lie. It's just simply data. So it's better than an eyewitness. It's better than anything that we can produce. It's right up there with DNA and, and, I just implore you, sometimes even if you think that selfie has nothing in the background, maybe there's a car that should be there that somebody said in their alibi, I parked right here next to this yeah. tree. And then there's that tree and there's not, your car's not there. Now, let's talk really quickly about this. Rumors going around, allegedly posted on Facebook. It's being reported that a local said police have footage from a doorbell cam of a masked man entering or at least walking up to the house around 3 a.m. and got a somewhat discernible screen grab of his eyes. And this was shown to the neighborhood frat sorority houses. And I guess the frat identified the photo instantly as a man who lives on the same street. Another local admitted that they in fact gave the footage to the police. So police might know if this is true at all. People are wondering, is this the lead that they mentioned on Lawrence Jones' show, but couldn't elaborate on? The person said either it's fake news or someone asked him to remove it. Another person commented on Facebook saying, this is not the same lead that the family mentioned, but they couldn't discuss it yet. So we don't know if this lead is true or false. You know, I've heard others, I keep hearing about allegedly some masked man. If it's true at all, I hope they really did catch him on video. I hope they really did catch this perpetrator on video. I hope someone did see his eyes. You know, if you get on Facebook, you're hearing all these weird, wild rumors like, oh yeah, Dylan allegedly saw the person, saw his eyes, but she ran away. So we don't know if any of this is true. Hopefully cops are getting a, a lot closer to the truth. People sometimes, unfortunately, 
certain people might take indeed facts and they might be running with wild rumors just to add on to it as if it's some type of fan fiction story. But I hope, hope police truly do have video of this person and maybe that's why they're honing in on it and who it is. It doesn't sound like it's a frat guy. You know, you've heard rumors, was it a frat guy after Ethan? or someone after Zayna. We don't know. We don't know who was targeted. They won't confirm if it was one person targeted. We just don't know yet. Take the last part with a grain of salt, but I can see the growing frustration because if they have honed in on who this person might be, at least let's get a sketch out based on that guy. You know, I know they want to hunt him down, but everyone in the area, everyone in the whole country, the whole world can help Hunt this guy down. If you get a sketch of him, release a snippet of the video, the surveillance video, the door ring camera. It's not just a few eyes looking for this person digitally and in person. You have a whole community. That's what I like what Steve said. He said, it's just data and then we can analyze it as a society. It's like crime fighting combined. It's like a crowdsourcing crime fighting where all of us are out there. If you have a screen image and release to the public and that way others can be kind of safe where you don't want to be looking at everyone with a side eye you walk past, but you do want to say, wait a minute, I recognize those eyes. Are they distinct? Are they a certain color? Are they a certain shape? Is there anything else that was seen if this is true at all about this masked person? Has he been linked to other crimes? Is he a serial offender? I know I was watching someone the other day who said, just because they did away with these four people doesn't make him a serial offender. Well, I don't know the semantics and the exact definition of a serial harmer, but I know if this person is linked to other crimes where more lives have been taken, cops do owe it to the community at large to say, look, this is what we know. Help us catch this person because it could be a citizen that ends up spotting the person and can immediately call 911 and help get the person off the street. So that's it for now. We'll see. I hope Kaylee's family keeps speaking out. Just keep telling what they know. Cops, of course, don't want the investigation ruined, but again, use everyone's backing them in society as an ally, not as an enemy, because everyone would want this person off the street, except the offender themselves, of course. But let me just close with a verse that a fellow YouTube creator was so kind to give me on this shirt. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's my prayer for the police, all the detectives working on this case and every single person, the examiners and forensics, CSI, everyone working hard on this case, you know, working through Thanksgiving, working through the holidays, you know, willing to take the heat of us running our mouths about stuff that we don't know that they are working hard on. So that's my prayer that they remember they can do all things through Christ. When they get that collar, they get those handcuffs on that guy and get him out of society. Thank you so much for watching and stay tuned.